Winnipeg's Classic 107 is CKCL, a Golden West radio station. That was a little sample of music that you will hear if you uh, decide to go check out the brand new ballet at the uh, Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra with the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra, RWB, and the composer Christos Hatzis. That was uh, a movement from Act One, Scene One. Uh, Christos Hatzis, uh, born in Greece, educated in the States, and he's uh, been living in Canada probably for almost the last 30 years or so, pretty close to 30 years. Uh, professor right now at University of Toronto. He has won numerous awards, including uh, two Juno Awards. And he's here in the studio with me this morning to chat about this amazing uh, collaboration of the ballet and your music and the symphony. And good morning, Christos. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. It's it's a true pleasure. Yeah. We had the chance to chat on the phone once uh, a number of months ago uh, about yeah. an Axos recording that came out a, a few months yeah. ago. Yes. And so it's really nice to have you here in person. Well, it doesn't, hap- doesn't yes. happen that often where I get yeah. to chat to somebody <laughs> on the phone and then... Uh, yeah. So it's really nice to have you here with me. Now, now I have a face to put to the voice, you know, so that's great. Well, I've seen your face, I guess, because I've seen it online. So that's okay. I've got one step up on you, but it's, uh, you've done so many, such a, a, a diverse uh, variety of works. And this work in particular, this collaboration with the ballet, um, it, it, inquire, it it's so many different elements that have to come together for this. How, first of all, before we, I mean, it's a big topic to, to chat about, but f- before we do that, let me, what, let's go back uh, a little bit. Let's go back a year or so and tell us how, how it all came about. I got a phone call out of the blue from Mark Godden, who is the choreographer who created uh, G- uh, Going Home Star, the, the title of the ballet, and uh, asked me if I would like to collaborate in this project, which was about the residential schools, and I didn't have... Uh, didn't have to think twice about that mm-hmm. because I'm very much interested and uh, um, almost I feel like I, I owe it, by being an immigrant I owe, I owe a debt to to Canada's Aboriginal people, you know, and uh, uh, and the residential schools is one of the darkest pages of Canadian history, you know. So I I definitely I accept it right away. And Mark apparently had gone through a lot of music uh, when he wanted to decide on a composer. And he had heard my uh, Inuit-inspired uh, uh, works from that I did in the, in the mid-90s. And that's what made him decide that he didn't know me, and I did, I, I did not know him at the time. So, mm-hmm. um, And then gradually I got to understand the uh, the process, and uh, I was very, we were very pressed for time because normally a ballet, full ballet score takes, you know, I don't know, in excess of two years, and uh, you know, I had about nine months, <laughs> and um, mm-hmm. so it's been a very pressured project. But sometimes this kind of pressure actually helps me make do some of my best music because. Mm-hmm. I'm just constantly at it. I don't have any. No I sleep. Can't take weekends <laughs> off. <yeah. laughs> so it's been, yeah. I <laughs> I took a sabbatical from U of T to be able to do this, and uh, and when I went back to school, normally you go back to school. You say, "Oh my God, I have to go back to work." But for me, it was like going the to vacation. vacation. <laughs> <laughs> so were, were you given? You were given the script, and you had to work straight from the script, or is that? Or? Well, yeah. Uh, 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 Joseph Boyden provided the story for this, mm-hmm. and 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 Mark more or less created the script, bouncing it off uh, Joseph, and uh, and Mark kept on saying that look at the script, but follow the music, you know, and then I can go back and rethink the script once I have the music because he, you know, like a lot of uh, uh, choreographers nowadays who don't 
work in original scores, a lot of the experience really comes from actually choreographing to existing music. In this case, mm-hmm. it, w- it would be the opposite, you know. But uh, but still, he, his, he felt like he should. He wanted to encourage me to write the music the way I felt that the music should go. And then, uh, and I wanted to follow the script because I didn't want to just kind of write another piece of abstract music. I wanted to make sure that the that the music somehow tells the story that's already being told through the script. So at the beginning, we had uh, it was a bit of you know everybody had to find their place, so to speak, mm-hmm. particularly me. And uh, and uh, it became an interesting an interesting process. I um, I because of all sorts of experiences in the past, you know, a composer who works on their own uh, finds themselves in a completely different dynamic and collaborative project. So I'm, I'm always have a certain kind of trepidation every time I go into a collaborative uh, uh, context as to will I fit in? Will my uh, will there be give and take in a way that it does not compromise my own thinking about uh, about music, and in this case, it was just like working with Mark. It was just incredible. I so mean, did you guys yeah. have to check in with each other every few constantly. weeks, constantly? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, and it was just uh, like I think we were uh, firing each other's imagination constantly uh, with our talks. You know, so it was it was. Um, I kept on saying, uh, "This is definitely not how I expected this to be." <laughs> <laughs> so where did where did you begin? I mean, musically. You know, obviously, you know, there's the Aboriginal element to yeah. it. So, I mean, there's well, a lot of different types of Aboriginal music. So, what? Why throat singing? What was the? Well, uh, we had the. Uh, we went through a number of different possibilities of artists, and you know, mm-hmm. and I chose uh, Tanya because she's not only a throat singer, but she she takes that medium and explores all sorts of of other spaces. No know? doubt about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, and 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 that kind of freedom, that kind of translation that we wanted to create. I mean, we're already telling a native story in the most non-native kind of art form, which is a ballet that was invented in, Europe. you know, in the court mm-hmm. of Louis the 15th, 14th, sorry. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and so, um, so the, a lot of translation was, and, and Mark kept on, uh, you know, kind of throwing at me that it's, it's the music that really can tell the story, the ballet will follow the music, you know. Uh, so, uh, and uh, so I came to the Winnipeg last December uh, with Mark and Tanya and also uh, Steve Wood, who is the founder and leader of the Northern Cree Singers, a really fantastic uh, group, very well known within the native communities of North America. And they've been, they had multi Grammy nominations and, and Tanya, of course, won the Polaris Award. That's right. Uh, yeah, you know, good timing for that. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, they're both. Uh, both of them ha- are visible outside of their communities, and uh, so we recorded Tanya and and, and uh, Steve doing all sorts of stuff because I, I didn't have music yet last December, you know. And then uh, um, anything that they could give us, I w- we would just experiment with all sorts of things. Steve sang some of his songs. Tanya has done a bunch of improvisations. Both of them read the Joseph Boyden text that we had already selected that would be part of this of this script. Mm-hmm. Um, they gave some really powerful readings, which are now part of the of, of, of the music. Uh, and then I went back home with tons of recorded material, and then that plus the script, and then I started trying to make sense of it. Like for example, in the the first scene that you just heard an, ex- an excerpt from uh, mostly takes place in a hair salon and, and nightclubs, you know, so, and it's 23 minutes of that. So in that one, you don't really have much native material in it because the, the character of Annie, uh, the lead character, mm-hmm. is basically a person who's trying to make it in the white world, thinks is is just totally capable of doing this. Uh, so, and it is only as he's being as he's failing to in, in that kind of life because he's been gradually realized that she's being discriminated at that she begins to understand that she's not who she's trying to be and she begins to discover all her own hurts that have been hiding all along inside her from the residential school experience so the native material comes gradually in the, in the uh, at the beginning the first act almost could have been the music for almost any other ballet, but it's certainly the first scene. And then gradually 
you begin to hear more and more of the mm -hmm. material that's been hiding inside these characters and they refuse to come to terms with. Now, do you draw from your own life, from your own experiences? I know that you've got, um, you're a spiritual person and you draw a lot from your spirituality. Do you tend to uh, draw from your own spirituality when you're delving into characters yeah. and delving into music as well? So how does that come into play? And it, 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 That's true. It always, it, it is always there. It's mm -hmm. not something I can negotiate in or out of my, of my work. Mm -hmm. um, in this, in this particular case, it was just a, it was just a continuous source of hurt, you know, because my spirituality, in some ways, uh, and the things that I believe in, uh, have become the source of pain for for the, some of your the, music, the people that I'm actually whose story I'm trying to, okay. to say, right? You know, so I'm, I'm you know, th there have been feelings of guilt, you know, through this. Uh, uh, and I think my my catharsis and my salvation in some ways would, came to me, it was how honestly can I actually tell their story, even, even if mine can actually be placed in a very, very dark uh, light, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and so that has been a, I mean, it has been a challenge for my own faith, you know, for sure. Uh, I don't think, I don't think your faith is any good if you don't challenge it, you know. And if, if it survives the challenge, then it's real. If it doesn't, then it's not, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, so it has been an incredible experience, but a very difficult one. Mm -hmm. And so I, the music that I, that we played, uh, you mentioned, is not the it's not a full symphony playing. Yeah. It's done on it's, it's somewhat computerized, but uh, done on a computer program with a full with a full orchestra. Yeah, um, and. Uh, later today, you're actually going to go in, and, a few, and, minutes, and, yeah. in <laughs> a few minutes. As soon as you're done here, you're going to go and hear it <laughs> performed by the whole symphony yeah. as well. So, how, yeah. how, do you, how do you feel about that? Are you excited? Well, are you nervous? It, are you? I'm uh, nervous because we are. Uh, I mean, it's a, first of all, the Winnipeg Symphony is a fantastic orchestra, and I have worked with them many times. Mm -hmm. So, it's not that I worry about how they're going to carry the score. That's that's a given that they, they're going to soar with it, you know. But. Uh, it's the, the connection with electronics. The, mm -hmm. It's a very complex score. It goes through. I mean, in the first scene alone, there is a, a scratch uh, DJing, you know, a throat singer, symphony orchestra, big band. Uh, oh, like yeah, almost yeah, like Duke yeah. Ellington. Typical kind of, piece. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm a generally have eclectic taste, but, but in this one, I have gone completely on the board. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going to be great. Um, I want to chat with you for just a couple more minutes before you go. But I, um, as you say, you've done uh, stuff with throat singing before, and I, I'm going to play this play this little clip from uh, Footprints in New Snow, which is yeah. a it's an old CBC recording, I believe, that came out probably yeah. what 15 years ago yeah. at least. And produce, do you wanna... I produced it with Keith Horner, the CBC producer uh, at the time. Uh, in in the mid 90s, we went up to Baffin Island, mm -hmm. and we recorded. Uh, throat singers and uh, interviewed elders from the community about throat singing and, and and the cultural significance that it had in the in the communities and then we put together um, a radio documentary which was um, both kind of the storytelling was in a documentary fashion but it, it was also a composition and basically inspired by what Glenn Gould had done uh, of his decades radio. earlier with mm -hmm. his idea of North, for example. Mm -hmm. And I had worked, collaborated on two such projects. The first one was called The Idea of Canada for CBC, and the second one was Footprints in Your Snow. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, let's have a listen to one movement from that, and then we'll uh, chat a little bit more. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
other things I hear and see and smell are, for example, the earth. You can smell the land because in the north the air is clear and clean, very clear and clean. And you can smell the flowers, the mosses, all of the lichens. They all give off an aroma. And this combined aroma is a whole variety of different little scents that you pick up. Another thing about the North is the expanse. is the expanse. Look out from any vantage point and you see expanse. out from any vantage point and you see expanse. Everything is out in front of you, like on a huge horizon. When you slowly look and scan across that, you see all these different things. You see rock formations. You wonder, really, how old is all this? How did we get here? you focus on some particular part of that landscape and maybe you'll see an animal or a bird or you'll see a small lake or pond and in it is life, fish, wildlife, birds and animals, caribou, seals, bears, all these things in them in their life, when I look at them, I, I see more than just an animal. I see, I see uh, something that that I'm connected to. That it's connected. To. And I think in the north, it's the land and the elements and everything that I'm connected to. I'm connected to. Seasons come and go quickly. Days come and go quickly. Nights fly by. It's an incredible power of something. Something always moving, always alive, always steady, always there. And from all that feeling, I've developed a sense of responsibility, responsible for the well-being of this. It looks after me, I look after it. Aliya 
It's a movement from a work called Footprints in New Snow by Christos Hatzis, and uh, I have him in the studio with me this morning because he's in town with the uh, Royal Winnipeg Ballet. They are premiering his his music, his music with uh, Going Home Star, which begins Wednesday, Wednesday, correct? Yes. Yes. And uh, we were just chatting while that piece was playing, and I was asking Christos how... how, um, how he brings all the elements together. I mean, you know, you're, you're not just talking about music. You're talking about vocals. You're talking about spoken word. You're talking about different genres. You're talking about, they almost seem to be worlds apart in a lot of ways, but you bring them together so it has a melody, so it has a voice of almost like one voice. I mean, that, that, how, does, how does it work like that? Well, in those days, uh, it, it was more difficult because the technology wasn't as advanced in terms of cross-referencing and putting things together. So then you actually had to find the connections as opposed to create them. And, but for me, in all my music, even when I don't, even when I write a s- string quartet or just a piece for orchestra alone, um, this is always my holy grail, is just to be able to find seemingly in- in- incompatible experiences uh, that in, in, in another context would bring people to conflict. <laughs> and and then still find the connecting threads that actually make them part of the same picture, you know. And I think in in a world that is kind of riddled with co- conflict like ours, you know, that's where music can actually bring some some solutions, mm-hmm. even though at a different level. But still, just trying to see before you you think you think them as different and incompatible. Look how they how they speak to one another. So how important is melody in a, in a, in a work? I don't, ha- I don't start, I mean, it's, it's important to me in my own makeup. Mm-hmm. I grew up in a culture that melody was just about everything, mm-hmm. you know, and in many, in a culture where a lot of the traditions were actually monophonic, so melody was the only thing you had. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, I don't, I never start my thinking about a new piece in terms of what's important and what's not important. I'm hoping that the material that I collect will start telling me the story of its own as to what's important and what is not. And then all I have to do is educate myself to learn that language. You know, so, and, and that's, when, that's when the composition really becomes worthwhile for me because I have learned something new about it, from it, you know. Um, mm. So I, I, to start by saying melody is important, it may have forced me to overlook some things which uh, don't have melody, for example. You know, so uh, so when I when I go into a new world to compose, I just don't think about what's important to me at all. Mm-hmm. I want to learn from my material everything that is to learn about composition. So, what did you learn from this working on this um, uh, this piece, Going Home Star? Is I. I this one for me was a lot of psychological uh, um, understanding of the characters, both the dark characters and the and the both the victims and the and the perpetrators. Mm-hmm. In some ways, there's a one scene in the second act which uh, it's only for orchestra and it's called the Dance of the Priests, and uh, it's pretty strong. And you know, they have this little small desks that they hit the floor with, you know. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a study in aggression in, uh, in choreographically. But for me, I, I remember very clearly that I could make them like, like black and white cartoon characters and, uh, and leave it at that. But, mm-hmm. but for me, it, it was, in some ways, it was those young people who left the comforts of Europe, driven by a certain kind of belief in in educating and civilizing the world. And at some point through this belief, again, it's a priori belief that, you know, that they're gonna go out there and save somebody, mm-hmm. turn them into monsters. 
you know, but the thing is that they were not monsters to start with. Uh, they pro- they were probably very high, highly ad- idealistic individuals, you know. And and when did that transformation happen? What caused it to happen? Why why could they not see themselves turning into you know? I- in other words, that what they actually preached and believed could not possibly have allowed treating other people the way they did. So you, you tried know, to see into the yeah, core so of, the, of them. Yeah, so, so the music itself kind of brings in. Uh, memories of different European cultures, like th- th- there's some klezmer kind of music. There's some, you know, there's all sorts of musical traditions, which, you know, th- th- which the roots of these people, so to speak, right? You know, who who voluntarily uprooted themselves to come into another, mm-hmm. in, in, into another strange land, and and uh, so it, so it is. It's not a simple black and white. It, it, it tries to. Uh, it doesn't ignore the truth, and the truth is pretty, pretty dark and, and, and very violent and unacceptable at any, at any human level. Mm-hmm. But in some ways, understanding the makeup of the perpetrator is also a, an important ingredient in making sure that this doesn't happen again. So reconciliation. Yeah, and the reconciliation. You know, mm-hmm. because you don't, if you don't understand where this person, how this person got transformed into this role, you know, then then you're not really creating any kind of safeguard about not repeating this, right? So how do you how do you begin to let a piece like this go? I mean, how do you rec- how do you how do, once once it's written yeah, and once I, I mean, what what's the process in terms of I think, moving yeah. on and and letting it have its own life now? I, mean, I I have found that when I deal with subjects, you know, specific subjects in my music, that if if you develop a certain kind of empathy. For all the characters that are in this in this play, almost like think, what would happen if you were in this situation? Mm-hmm. For example, that kind of empathy. In other words, that not not agreeing with the characters, but but becoming for a second that character and just looking from the inside out and see how does the world the world looks like. Once you kind of do this, you know, which has nothing to do with the music, then I just let the music flow. But then I know that. Uh, if I, if I'm the priest <laughs> at that moment, and you know, and I can just kind of see from inside out, then uh, however painful and difficult that may mm-hmm. be, then um, then the music will tell that story, you know. And then when I become the child that's being abused, you know, then uh, then the music will that moment will also tell that story, you know. And I don't quite try to figure out what will be. What's the recipe? What's the connection between what kind of notes or sounds or rhythms or stuff like that I will use to tell that story? I think that kind of happens mm-hmm. in in some sort of auto- automatic way, you know. So my 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 center in some ways is to always be to have the empathy to understand that character wow, and wow. become that character. Yeah. So it was very dark. I mean, I I had more anxiety attacks during this project than I ever had in my life, you know, and... Well, I'm uh, not happy to hear that, but... I'm yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, it was... But it was part of the process. I kind of, mm-hmm. kind of knew that as I was going into this, that this this was inevitable, yeah. So this is really a lesson, a life lesson, lesson in philosophy, yeah. lesson in psychology, yeah. lesson in uh, love, compassion, um, yeah. understanding, and, and uh, I guess... You know, when when it, and it's in front of the audience, we really hope that it comes across and is powerful. And uh, congratulations! Well, and thank I, you. I'm you know, I haven't heard the whole piece yet, but I'm really looking forward to hearing the whole thing. We just got a little snippet of Act One, Scene One. I'll play more of that a little bit after. But uh, it's a really uh, fabulous project, and uh, very um, blessed, I suppose, to have have you compose the music for the RWB and the symphony, and we. Uh, Look forward to more collaborations if possible. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I hope I hope you have a fantastic uh, week here in Winnipeg. And I'm pretty sure I will. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're gonna, bef- yeah. Before we leave, I'm going to play a, a work from the String Quartet number uh, one, uh, St. Lawrence String Quartet, a work that you compose. And it, I'm playing it because it also does have a link to uh, Aboriginal yeah. music. And I'll play that, and then I'll try to revisit some, a little bit more of the, uh, give people a little more taste of... Yeah. Um, of the uh, ballet music because here they haven't heard it this is the first time you'll hear it and right. <laughs> it's exciting for us to be able to do that so do you want to cue up this uh, string quartet just quickly yeah so this is uh, uh three quarters into the piece itself and uh it the the main uh the main elements is inuit throat singers and and locomotive trains 
and uh, uh, of course the, the two never met uh, in, in in real time because the trains never went that far <laughs> north but the uh, but the, the interesting thing is that the train was in fact the first technology that united Canada from coast to coast as turned into a vast territory into a country and at the same time carried uh, all the seeds of destruction of of the native communities, right, from germs to to um, the colonial mm-hmm. uh, migration, which you know, which displaced uh, native communities, and in in when I play those two, which sound very different, dif- uh, similar rather, because the Inuit just breathe in and out in the in the throat, saying, and so does the puffing train of the of the local the rhythmic, the rhythmic yeah. sound, yeah. but the Inuit. Sometimes the you know it throat singing sounds almost like an exorcism to get to get the train away. So to speak. <laughs> My dad was a railway engineer in locomotive trains, so I have completely different different kind of sentimental, sentimentality, yeah, yeah. Uh, connection to mm-hmm. the trains than I'm depicting in this particular piece. So, well, yeah. Let's have a listen. This is the St. Lawrence String Quartet with uh, music by Christos Hatzis, String Quartet Number One.
St. Lawrence String Quartet with one of the movements from Christos Hatzi's String Quartet, number one. And uh, it was a pleasure having Christos in the studio with me just minutes ago. And he's off to watch the first rehearsal uh, with the uh, symphony orchestra, the first time he will see the orchestra perform the piece of, uh, that he will be doing with the Royal Winnipeg Ballet, Going Home Star, which begins Wednesday, October 1st, and runs right through October 5th. 